Uh, first, I could thank the invitation to speak. Um, so I'm going to discuss some uh, mainly non-uniqueness issues uh, in mean curvature flow. So I don't assume anyone actually know mean curvature flow. So I will start with the very basic definition. So the first part, let me use this book here. Okay, so, so I'm going to start with uh, uh, defining mean curvature flow. So this is going to be uh, one parameter family of embeddings. from n-dimensional manifold M to Rn plus 1, uh, the n plus 1 dimensional Euclidean space. So you could also consider immersions. Okay. So this is satisfy a uh, uh, differential equation. So this here, it is the mean curvature vector. <coughs> of mt at point f p t. Okay, so, so I guess for this audience, I guess I don't need to uh, explain the mean curvature vector is right. So, Okay, so uh, this is the uh, definition for mean curvature flow. So next I want to make some remarks about this definition. So first, so one can show that uh, in the view of PDE, so this is a weakly parabolic Quasi linear system. So the point is uh, uh, it is weakly instead of uh, uniformly parabolic. Because, so the equation is invariant under diffeomorphism. So it's always uh, has some kernel in the symbol. So it's only weakly parabolic. So Second, so there is the equivalent definition for mean curvature flow. So here we require that so the velocity of this uh, embeddings uh, is given precisely by the mean curvature vector. But uh, indeed, if we just keep track the image of the embedding that MT, so so you may allow some tangential diffeomorphism. Then the equivalent you can define the mean curvature flow in the following way. So instead of a require this, you require the normal part of the velocity, it is equal to the mean curvature vector. Okay. So <clears throat> more precisely, so suppose you are given a family of embedding that satisfy this equation. So if you, for simplicity, let's assume M is compact. So then you can find a one parameter family of diffeomorphism. Okay, so this is the field. Such that, so this F composed with this diffeomorphism diffu diffu phi, it is going to satisfy. Okay. 
Okay, so actually in, in the practice, it's more convenient to use this as a definition of a meter flow mm -hmm. instead of this one. So the third remark is, is about a uh, rational uh, explanation for the mean curve flow. So namely, you can think about it as a gradient flow. of the volume functional. Yes. So for, um, for simplicity, let's assume M is compact again. So then to differentiate uh, see, volume of MT, then you're going to get this is equal to the integration of the square of the mean curvature vector on MT. So this here is the volume element on MT. Okay. Right, so basically this kind of uh, mm, Identity shows you that uh, in some normalized sense, so this mean curvature flow decreases the volume in the stiffest way. Okay, okay. so from this uh, explanation, right, so immediately you see so minimal hypersurface is going to be a stationary solution to the flow. Right? So, corollary, so minimal. Upper surface as stationary solution <coughs> to mean curvature flow. Okay. So and of course, so okay, so. Um, by this remark, right, so you can think about, okay, so in theory you can use flow to find the critical point, so it's not a very effective way to do that. Okay. So besides this stationary solution, there are other interesting uh, special solutions to mean curve flow. Uh, mostly we're interested in these self-similar solutions. So in general, there are three types of uh, self-similar solutions. So first one is the shrinkers. So these solutions has the property that so the t times less, it is given by a suitable scaling of minus one t times less. So, so the solution exists for all negative time. And the, the, geom the ge geometric shape is the same, but uh, they differ by a scaling. So it's a shrinker because it's actually shrinking uh, with the time. Okay. And also, another so, uh, type of uh, self similar solution, which is called expander. So compare with the shrinker, so expander it just means that the shape is the same, but then you, the solution is expanding with the time. So a third half is called the translator. So this one, it is just, sorry. Ah, oh, it's not use that. Sorry, this is M, M. Then it's translate along some direction. So then the solution is this for all times. Okay. So these self-similar solutions often appear as uh, models for singularities of the flow. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so um, this basically uh, the definition of microflow. So next, I want to talk about uh, some short time existence. Use this. So it's actually now uh, due to a uh, uh, theorem by Ecker Huiskin. And I think Hamilton also has some work related. So if you start with nice embedding, So here M, we, I don't assume M to be compact, so M may be non-compact, but if M is non-compact, then we want to make assumption that, uh, let me may, maybe use M, so zero. Okay. So this denotes the second fundamental form. Right, so you, if you start with such embedding, then you can find a unique solution to the Minker flow starting from this embedding. Okay, so then Satisfy. Okay. So um, for this theorem, so I can give you some idea of the proof without uh, going into the uh, a prior estimate. So, so the idea is like, uh, so maybe for simplicity, let's only consider the case that M is compact. So for general M, it can be achieved by approximation argument. So let's just consider M is compact. Okay, so, so then the first step is so instead of trying to solve this system directly, because this is a weakly parabolic, so it's not going to be easy to use some like an implicit function theorem to solve. But, but uh, as I already mentioned in the remark, think here. Right, so we can first try to solve equation like this. Then we try to find the parameterization to get solution like <coughs> this. Okay. So. Here is uh, your M0, okay. right? So then you can uh, choose, make a choice of the normal, say, it's a choice of uninormal on M0, okay? Right, so any nearby hypersurface uh, can be parameterized as a normal graph of M over M0, right? So you can, because a priori you can just, you know, if, if it's a nice solution, a priori should be something nice around M0. <gasps> sorry, sorry, I forgot to say this is for T, not for all T, but uh, for some capital T0. <coughs> Right, so, so then uh, a priori can assume that, so mt um, 
it is of the form like uh, p plus t and p. Okay, so p it is in m zero. Okay, right. So assuming this m t is it is a mean curve flow, right? So then it's going to satisfy the point, the normal velocity of the point is given by mean curvature, right? So then you can actually write down the equation for W, right? So, so then W is going to satisfy And initially, it is just zero, right? So initially, m t is just m zero, then w is zero, right? Right. So after you write it down in this form, then you you will observe. I mean, by computation, you will observe as long this quantity is bounded, then this is going to be basically uniformly parabolic. Then you can appeal to the standard cross-linear parabolic theory to actually solve it for a short time. Okay. And step two, it is just modify this parametrization, say f tilde, by composing with such different morphism phi. Okay. Step two. So find phi. So here, the, the hard part is to prove some a prior estimate, which I omit. So, but I think you can find it in standard textbook uh, in parabolic partial differential equation, like the book by. Uh, so for the a priori estimate, so one can refer to this book. Linear and quasi linear PDE of parabolic tab. So this is very famous book. If you type the title in the Google, it will be the first. <laughs> so <laughs> unfortunately, I can't remember the, the, the name of the author, which is three Russians, which is very difficult for me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I mean, any, any textbook, you can find such estimate. So yeah. And OK, so this, this basically shows that as long as the, uh, the second fundamental form of the initial embedding is actually bounded, then you can always find a solution to Minkir flow exists for some uh, small time uh, t0. Okay. Very good. Okay. So a very important remark I'd like to make is uh, in general, the long time existence fails. Okay, so, so if 
m is compact. Then long time existence of mean curvature flow fails. Okay. So what do I mean by fails? It just means that uh, in PDE view, it's just like you can't find a solution satisfy this equation. And in other words, you can mm, refer this as the curvature, the second form of the embeddings actually blow up in finite time. So to see this remark, so we have to talk about this avoidance principle. Actually, it's very important uh, uh, property for the flow. So it is basically a geometric way to say a parabolic maximal principle. So it states that the following. So if you have a two flow, say they exist for some And if initially they are disjoint, then they, they remain disjoint for all time. Uh, sorry, I, I think I need to also assume that one of the flow is actually compact. So the proof of this uh, widens principle, which is uh, fairly easy. So one can prove it by contradiction. So argue by contradiction. Okay. So assume tau. Is the time that the f is the first time that M, T, M and N they intersect. So this means that M tau intersect N tau is not empty. But for any time less than tau, they are disjoint. Okay. So what's the special uh, property for the first time? First intersection time is so. Let's say you take a point which is in lying in the intersection, right? Because it's the first time they intersect, so at this intersection point x zero, the tangent plane of m tau and n tau have to be same. So the t x tau t x 0 m tau equal to t x 0 m tau. Say it's a tangent plane. Okay. Right, so if it's at the other time, they may actually intersect uh, transversally. But uh, the first time, they have to be touched. Okay, so, so then near this Okay, so let me maybe write here. Um, let's see. Mm, maybe here. Okay, so 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 f for T which is uh, substantially close to cis uh, tau, say. And for R, which is 
positive and less than much more than one. Okay, so 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 then then you look at the evolving hypersurface MT inside this small ball around x zero. So it is actually given by a graph of a function, say w over some subset, sub, some subset of the tangent plane P. Okay. So, so then you can write down the equation for this function w, so it's going to satisfy this equation. Right, so I'm going to introduce some notations. So after all the tedious calculation, then you will find out, so this can be written as some aij x. Okay, so this di means taking partial derivative with respect to the s coordinates, okay? Right, similarly, for nt intersector B R x zero, so it's given by a graph of a function, say, v x t. Okay, so this v actually going to satisfy uh, the same equation. Right, so the conditions on this uh, MT and NT is going to translate to, say, in that picture, I think it's like, a, uh, say, W T less than equal to V X T and W zero tau equal to V X tau, something like that. Right, so now you can uh, use the maximal principle uh, for the parabolic equation to deduce this is a contradiction. Okay. So in practice, you just uh, consider the of these two equations and a real arrange term. And this is the local, uh, the difference is going to be the local maximum, and then you can get additional information on the gradient, which is vanishing. Then you can use the maximum principle to see the contradiction. So, then the maximum principle going to this contradiction. Okay. Um, yeah, so then why this avoidance, avoidance principle t going to tell you that uh, for any compact initial data, the flow will uh, develop singularity in finite time? It is because then you can compare with the sphere. So your M0 is like this. Then you enclose it by a very large sphere. Okay. Right, so the evolution of sphere is easy to uh, figure out because it's a rotation symmetric. Then the PDE become ODE, so it can be computed that it's actually self-similar shrinking to a point in finite time. In particular, it will develop singularity in finite time. So then using the avoidance principle, you see, so if M0, if the flow starting from M0 except for all time, it's going to violate that uh, principle. Okay. Okay, so. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so So 
so far, we've gone through all this pretty classical theory for mean curve flow, right? So the short time existence, and we also realized that, OK, so the flow will develop finite singularity for sure. So the next step is to consider uh, what should we do with the singularities. Okay, so for this talk, I'm not going to focus on analyzing the asymptotic behavior of the flow near singularities. I'm going to focus on discuss uh, Warai's notion of a weak mean curve flows. Okay, so okay. So there at least. Uh, four notions of weak mean curve flow that I knew, but probably more than that. Okay, so I'm going to uh, focus on two, which is uh, related to the later discussion. So the first one, which is the Brachy flow. Okay. So what is, so before I give you the definition of Brachy flow, let's just, uh, give some intuition about the definition of the Brachy flow. So it's actually uh, related to, say, if you have a parabolic equation, how you define a weak solution to a parabolic equation, or some other type of a PDE that you're going to use test function. So say, if you have mean curvature flow, mt, right? So, OK, so it is given by some parabolic equation, which is written in this way, right? Okay. So now, if I choose any uh, function phi, say it is a C2 function on the whole space, with compact support, and okay. So now I consider uh, integral uh, of this phi uh, on mt, right? So let's compare with the uh, remark that we gave in the beginning after the definition of meter flow, it is a gradient flow of every functional, right? So we're, uh, there we choose the phi equal to one. Here we just let phi to be arbitrary function with compact support, right? So, so then you do the computation. This is basically uh, So it is a um, basic computation in geometric analysis, so I'm just going to write down the formula directly. So, okay. Um, let's see, here is minus. So this is taking the gradient of phi, okay, and inner product with this, okay. So basically, this is actually a two equivalent definition. So, so for any such phi, it is going to satisfy this kind of formula, right? So the definition of Brachy flow, it is actually. Uh, coming from this formula. The only difference is, so instead of consider equality, here is going to be inequality. Why we need to consider inequality is because eventually, so we, what we need to, what we need this weak flow satisfy is some kind of a compactness property. Now if you imagine you have a family of classical mean curve flow, and then you take a limit, right? So now you want to figure out, so, so what's the uh, property or what's the equation or in inequality limit to satisfy. So you can't satisfy this equality because if you look at this part, so the integral of h squared is the lower semi-continuous. So that's going to tell you that it's hopeless you consider equality. You have to consider inequality. If you expect 
after if you expect the, the weak notion of flow satisfies some compactness property. Right? <coughs> So now I'm going to write down the precise definition. Right here. Okay. So the definition I'm writing down now, it is not the same as Brackey originally gave. So he is considered even more general set of the variables. So I'm going to restrict to uh, I'm going to discuss the version that uh, Tom Eumann uh, gave. Okay, so, you have a one parameter of family of random marrow. C mu t. Um, right, this is a bracky flow <coughs> E for Of course, if I change to inequality, I, I have to restrict to the sign of the phi to be positive function. Okay. So I'm going to basically just So here, I want to make a remarks. Okay, so about how to understand the right hand side. So I'm not claiming that uh, for every mu t the right hand side actually makes sense. So you should understand in the way that as, if it doesn't make sense, it's equal to minus infinity. Okay. And. Also, this it is So here, this H, it is the generalized mean curvature. Okay. okay, so this is one way to define a, a weak mean curvature flow. So, um, so let let. Is let is a rectifiable measure or something? Oh, actually, in the definition, I don't. In the definition, it's not assumed, but in practice, so initially you always assume uh, it is uh, rectifiable, and then he actually, so Bracky or Tom actually proved that for almost every t, it is actually rectifiable. Yeah, but in the definition that I use actually a uh, copy from Tom's paper. He didn't assume rectifiability, but he actually he has a different notion, but uh, I just uh, uh, take a shortcut saying that, OK, so if it doesn't make sense, it's minor infinity. It's the same as his notion. Yeah. By that, it means that, for instance, if mu t is not rectifiable, then, of course, the right hand side doesn't make sense, then it's minor infinity. Yeah, that's his notion. Another thing I cheat a little bit, originally here you need to also put the tangent, generalized tangent plane. But uh, then um, Bracky showed that for almost every time. So 
the mean curvature is actually normal to the I just mm, I just I just use this notation. It doesn't lose anything after after brachial tongue proof all this hard theorem. Okay. Okay, so um, so so as I said, so mm, for this notion, you do have uh, some compactness property for uh, this bracket flow, but there is a, a significant drawback uh, about this method is, so by definition, you could have actually the so-called gratuitous vanishing phenomenon. Because, so in this definition, it's not, so even you have, a, say, the classical uh, mean curve flow, so you could actually use it uh, to construct infinitely many bracket flows, right? So, 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 so let me just explain. So suppose you have, say, some classical mean curvature flow, okay? So now I can construct a <coughs> infinite many bracket flow by the following. So I'm just taking uh, mu t to be the n-dimensional house of marrow restrict to mt for t between t1 and 0. Otherwise, say for any t1 less than t0, this is obviously going to satisfy this inequality. It's basically this inequality tells that you can have you, the flow in the classical curve needn't to be moved by mean curvature vector as long as it actually decrease the volume faster than the mean curve flow is allowed. So, 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 so this obviously uh, allowed, right? So this multi going to satisfy this inequality, right? So obviously this is going to lead some non-uniqueness issue for the flow, right? But uh, later I'm going to return to this topic, you will see, so, uh, this is not the only reason that you get the non-uniqueness of the bracket flow. There are actually there are other reason that uh, the, there are other reason that is not uh, this kind of uh, vanishing phenomenon also give the non-uniqueness non phenomenon. Okay, so. So the next uh, different notion of weak mean flow, which is uh, called a level set flow. Okay. So the idea is the following: you say if you have an initial hypersurface M zero, and then you can s embed M zero as a zero level set of some function. So if your M0 actually initially to be a smooth hypersurface, then you can actually use the distance function, right? But of course, there are more than one choice of this U0 so that you can make M0 to be the zero level side of U0. Okay. So we will always assume U0 is Lipschitz function, uh, uh, S1. And for some technical reason, we will also assume that u0, which is equal to some constant c0, maybe less than 0, all set compact set. Okay. So, so the idea of the level set flow is instead of uh, evolve one surface, it's evolve every level set of this function. So formally, it's defined by evolve I mean curvature. Okay. 
right? So then you're going to get uh, one family, uh, one parameter family of uh, functions. So that satisfy. this equation. Okay. So this capital D denotes the gradient in spatial direction. Okay. So x is in R plus one and T is positive. Right, so and initially this function it is given by u0 x okay. and this x okay. right so let me explain a little bit how I derived that equation which is fairly easy come from the chain rule okay so by this uh, formal definition right so u x t equal to c is evolved by mean curvature, right? So, if you consider if you consider on a level set, right? So, then you just using the chain rule, and then this is du zero, okay? And this part here it should be the mean curvature vector of this level set, okay? Right. So then the mean curvature vector. It is going to be given by minus divergence of the normal of the level set times the unit normal. Okay. Right, so then this gives you okay. right, so I'm I'm looking at the C level set, then I'm applying, I'm taking derivative to T, right? So using chain rule, then I get this equation. This is how you get this equation from this uh, formal definition, okay? Why is, for, why is formal? I mean, because you see, so all this calculation doesn't make sense if you're at a critical point of view. So you can apply this because Oh, this only rigors when du is not zero, right? When du is zero, this this argument is only formal; it's not rigorous, right? So, so uh, indeed, actually, this initial value of problem does not have a classical solution. It has a weak solution in the viscosity sense, but I don't want to explain the definition of viscosity in this talk. It's going to be too technical. So the idea is like uh, using some like uh, tangential uh, tangen tangential uh, principle to define this uh, uh, viscosity solution. So let me just remark that this problem star. So this is work by Evans, Sprague, and Chen. Okay, so the star has a unique weak solution for all times and in the viscosity sense. So actually, this this kind of method is not first was not first introduced by uh, these people. So it was introduced by uh, two applied mathematicians, Auscher and uh, Sessu. So they introduced this uh, so-called level set method to study other problem in applied math, like uh, imaging processing. But then mm, these two group of people independently uh, give a rigorous mathematical treatment for the theory. Okay. Okay, so, so, the, so the advantage of this is the solution is actually unique and it actually has a nice maximum principle. So, but uh, the disadvantage of this method it is the following uh, so-called uh, fattening phenomenon.
So not that. So though I formulated this level set flow, assuming that M zero is a smooth hypersurface, but uh, actually you don't you don't have to uh, only consider that kind of uh, initial data. For instance, so uh, some immersed curve is actually can uh, be included in the initial uh, condition. Like if you have some initial condition, like the initial. Um, data like this, right? So you can also realize as a zero level set of some Lipschitz function. Okay, so then it's allowed. Okay. So say if I have an initial uh, in this case I'm considering curves, say like a immersed curve with crossing here. So now I wanna examine um, how this curve evolve under the level set flow. So uh, what you want to see is like immediately, okay, so it is going to uh, develop an interior region. Okay. So for any t positive, so this white curve is going to become uh, this red region here. So, so there's an easy way to see why this has to be true is, so for the curve, if it's an embedded curve, you can compute the change of the area of the domain enclosed by the curve has to be equal to minus 2 pi. Right, so now, so you approximate this white curve from outside by one embedded curve, and you can also approximate the white curve inside by two embedded curve. But then there's a difference between the area change under the flow, right? So it's different by minus two pi. So that's why you're going to have this interior region develop, right? So anyway, so this kind of uh, fattening phenomenon, so basically is the main disadvantage of this method here, right? So you know, for, for, for this initial, uh, it, though it's uh, immersed, but you can still talk about lens, but for this one, you can't talk about lens an, anymore, right? And it's happened not, it's happened immediately for any positive time, right? So, but there's, but I wanna say that this actually is this uh, non-generic phenomenon. So which means that, so yes, you look at the white curve, you do get the uh, interior region. But if you look at any curve, you know, if you look at uh, some curve that arbitrates more close to this white curve, it actually may not develop interior region. Actually, for, for any such white curve, you can always do any small perturbation so that this phenomenon doesn't happen. Actually, for all time, doesn't happen. And when this doesn't happen, so actually Tom Ullman uh, proved that you can associate to this level set a bracket flow. Okay. So. Okay. okay so now, uh, in the last five minutes of the first hour, so so I just like to uh, explain. Briefly, so the relation between this flattening of level set flow and the non-uniqueness of a bracket flow. Okay. okay. So to explain this, so uh, there, I, have to, I, I have to tell you that uh, there's a so-called enhanced bracket flow, which, which it is a bracket flow, but has better property than, slightly better property than bracket flow. So basically, so I, I will attribute to white. Okay. 
So you can see the, the non-uniqueness imply fattening of the level set flow. Okay. So basically, mm, to see this statement, so there's uh, another uh, notation which Tom uh, introduced, which is called the set theoretical subsolution of mean curvature flow. So the definition is very easy. So it just says, OK, so suppose you have a family of closed sets. So it is a set theoretical subsolution if for any mean curvature flow this holds. It's defined by a uh, Warden's principle, basically. So the point is like, uh, so in, in, in Tom Eumann's uh, book, uh, this elliptic regularization book, so he showed that, so the support of the bracket flow, it is a set theoretical subsolution. And the level set flow, it is the maximum set theoretical subsolution. Okay, so basically, so all this uh, bracket flow, the support should be contained in the level set flow. Okay, so when this uh, non-unique happen, so you can think about, so, so say if you have some non-unique happen, maybe like this, okay, so then the, then all this region bounded by this uh, bracket, the support of the bracket flow is going to be part of the level set flow. So, um, yeah, so that's the relation between the non uniques and the fattening. Okay, so I think it's maybe, the, maybe a, good time, a good place to stop. And um, yeah. Okay, so um, so I just want to mention uh, one uh, important uh, conjecture about uh, this fattening or non-fattening of levels of flows. There's a conductor due to Evansburg and independently the Georgia. So, so in this example, you see. So, if I give you some immersed or some initial data with singularities, actually uh, may fatten right immediately. But then it's a natural question to ask if your initially if your uh, surface is uh, smooth, say. Not happen for smooth services. Okay. So actually, so I think uh, there's announcement by Yumanan 
and white. So they disprove this conjecture. Okay. So, but the paper is not uh, uh, available yet. Okay. But uh, so they have uh, some sketch of the idea how to construct such uh, counter example. But on the other hand, so so white. So this is actually uh, a theorem uh, in the uh, ICM proceeding 2002. So <laughs> so uh, so actually uh, on the other hand, so uh, white make the conjectures saying that so if your surface so the the counter example in their uh, they propose has the high genus so they claim uh, so white conjecture that so if if the surface has genius zero, then the conjecture is true. Okay. So there's a, a, a important reason progress towards this conjecture. So due to uh, uh, Chow, uh, Hasselhofer, uh, Hirschkowitz. So the, assuming the multiplicity one conjecture, then this is true. Okay. But uh, now the question is reduced to the uh, multiplicity one conjecture. So which is uh, about the multiplicity of the tangent flow of uh, weak mean curvature flow. Okay. So anyway, so. So this is some uh, conjecture related to the fattening phenomenon. Okay. And the reason that uh, people are interested in such conjecture, uh, it is so presumably if you can prove these things, then you may actually try to understand the uh, uh, family of flows, then you can actually, from there, you may actually give some proof of some mm, topological uh, results. Say, maybe you can use it to give another proof of male conjecture. Okay. But, uh, mm, but this is something open. And so why we want to uh, understand or interest in this non-uniqueness of the flow, so one motivation is like, so as I said, so if you start with uh, closed hypersurface, then the flow develops in large infinite time, right? So it's known that the, um, the behavior, as not behavior of the flow um, near the singularity before the singular time is modeled by self-shrinkers, right? So a class, the, for self-shrinkers, so, the problem is like, uh, so there are infinitely many self-shrinkers. And if we restrict to, say, two-dimensional so surface in R3, so we know that the asymptotic behavior of the shrinker is either cylindrical or conical. And then there's a conjecture due to Ilmanen says the if you have a shrinker asymptotic to a cylinder along some n, then it has to be isometric to the cylinder. So basically, if you believe that conjecture, then basically you either get in R3, you either get cylindrical singularity or spherical singularity or asymptotic conical singularity. Actually, there are infinitely many examples of uh, shrinkers that are asymptotic to cone. Okay, so if you are having some asymptotic conical singularity, maybe like this, okay, right, so then it's going to, uh, Flow self shrinking way, and then it's going to form a cone. And this is this cone here, it's actually the tangent cone of the shrinker, right? So now, of course, then if you want to understand the flow, the behavior, possible behavior of the flow through the singularity, so the model case is to understand the flow starting from the cone. Right, so 
we want to understand some mean curvature flow. Actually, here has to be some weak mean curvature flow. Starting from a cone. Okay. Right, ideally, you want to say, okay, so if there are some unique or canonical uh, weak mean curvature flow, that will be uh, good. Right. So, but the issue is like uh, that's the main uh, thing we're going to discuss in this hour. That actually uh, the uniqueness, uh, non uniqueness, actually is the true property here. So, you you will find a lot of cones that actually there are actually infinitely many uh, weak mean curve flow that starting from the cone. So here, you can think about it as a bracket flow. Okay. So as I said, so another way to think about it is like, uh, so if you think about it as a level set flow, that means the level set flow is actually flattening. Okay, okay so... Mm, Let's maybe present the theorem here. So um, the main theorem I want to discuss today, it is so you can actually find the open subset of double cones in R3. So let's see this open subset V says that for every cone C this set V so there exist at least three distinct <coughs> expanders That asymptotic to this cone, right? So recall expanders. They are special solution of the flow in which that later time slice is a scale up copy of the initial of, of the early one, right? So if an expander asymptotic to cone, which means that so then it's going to generate a flow that's starting from the cone that asymptotic to, right? And moreover, so we can show that so two of them they are topological annuli, and the third one is a pair of disks. So here we consider um, double cones, which means that the cone has a two, the link of the cone has a two compo component, but not necessary to be rotation symmetric. So it, it's just the link has to be some CK alpha uh, curve in the unisphere. Okay. And moreover, you can act, we can actually, by our construction, you can see that uh, one of this gamma one, say it is stable, one is unstable, and this is actually the minimizer. So the point of this theorem is not just to exist uh, three different examples. The point is to, to emphasize the topology here. So this theorem tells you two forms of a non-uniqueness. First, so given the cone, you may have an uh, expander has a two different topological type. Second, even within fixed topology type, you may have more than one expanders. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I can draw it. Mm -hmm. 
so so uh, let me first make remarks so the rotation symmetry case was discussed uh, discovered by uh, Agonant and Holman Stouffer. Okay, so the picture is actually similar uh, to this general case. So you go to consider very fat uh, double cone. Okay, and uh, this gamma one two three looks like the following. Okay, so. This is going to be gamma 3. And uh, gamma 2. And then uh, maybe this is gamma 1. Let's see. So, so I draw it, it looks like they're this drawn, but so eventually using other methods you can prove it's this drawn, but in this method we don't actually care whether they're this drawn or not. So the point is like, uh, so the topology, so, so you will get one is like a pair of disc and then the other two is like annular. But of course I don't claim that's the only three. You could have actually more than three. But of course, so if you now you not restrict to this special class of solutions starting from the cone, say you don't require to be expander, you can actually use this expander to actually interpolate, construct infinitely many uh, weak linker flow coming out of the cone. Mm. So we care about this uh, topological difference because if you're really interested in having any topological application using the flow, that's, you know, having a geometric difference, that's okay, but having topological difference is really an obstacle. So you have to understand, okay, so how this happened. And so I gave a talk earlier uh, last year. So under some entropy condition on the cone, then we can actually show this topological non-uniqueness cannot happen. So the geometric uniqueness, non-uniqueness may happen. Okay. So, so, but uh, for this talk, I'm just going to focus on how can we construct these examples. Uh, do we need dimension three here? Or yes, I don't need the dimension three. Yeah. Um, Actually, because, because the measure we use is the degree measure, so we need a, some like a um, compactness, so yeah. But uh, some of them is dimension, no dimension restriction. The gamma 3 is constructed by minimizing procedure, then it's always successful dimension. And I think the only thing matter is this, uh, gamma two line in between, but uh, I think, you know, you, so, so if you don't care about the topology, I don't think you need to restrict to dimension three, but you do care topology, then you need to restrict dimension three. So if you don't care about uh, the thing, the topology of the expansion reconstructed, you could have other methods to do this because then you can use rational method to construct three examples, but then you don't, ne you don't necessarily know the topology of all these examples. But, uh, but in dimension three, so we, we use the degree method, then is a parameterized uh, method, then you can control the topology of the example you construct. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so, Yeah, single cone is uh, is very easy. Uh, no, no, single cone. I don't know whether you can construct uh, three examples. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 
And actually, you can if you know the cone is somehow graph, the link of the cone is actually given by a graph. Say the cone is actually graphical, then you you can only construct one. Uh, that's basically uh, the result due to accurate whisking. Yeah. Okay, so mm. so as I said, so um, so here we're going to basically use uh, minimizing procedure to construct this pair of disk, and then uh, use uh, some uh, continuity method to construct an annular. Okay, so um, the first step is to construct uh, uh, the pair of disks. So this is actually uh, using some minimization. Minimizing procedure. So, which is sketched by Tom Eumann and later on Dean filling uh, the full details. Okay. Um, I mean, here, so say you have uh, some cone, so with two components, right? So. If you want to use a minimization procedure, so you're going to um, do the minimization for each component of the cone. Because if you do for the whole, you're not necessary to get a parallel disk. But you can actually think of the cone, uh, say, maybe this pass, this C minors. Okay. Right, so you for, you can basically by their argument you can see that expander. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention one important thing, because I I didn't tell you what do I mean by minimizing, right? <laughs> I I just assume everyone know that the. expander is a critical point of some functional, but I haven't write down the functional. Okay, so. So, so the expander, a critical point of this functional like this. Okay. So a quick remark is that uh, there's no compact expander. Every expander has to be non-compact. So this functional only formally defined. So this critical point is with respect to any uh, compact support variation, right? Okay, so then it's become uh, clear what I mean. This is E-minimizing, okay? So basically you, you take one component of the cone, say C plus, Okay, so then using minimizing procedure, then you can construct, right? And then do the same thing for the another component. Uh, Okay, so so again, why is the disk? You need to um, using some degree method to justify. Okay, so so I will going to uh, repeat that uh, part in in the annular part. Okay. So, mm, uh, if the cone is uh, mean convex, it's unique. But uh, if it's not, then it's question. 
Ja. Mm. But anyway, so... Okay, so... So I guess the only... Uh, the only point that uh, is maybe not that trivial is because you're doing this minimization procedure on non-compact manifolds, so you have to worry about things is not going to drift to infinity, and then the asymptotic behavior is actually uh, the prescribed one, right? So then, one here, one need to use some barrier argument. So the barrier is the following. Okay, so what this looks like, okay, so basically it just looks like, say, this is direction V. So the boundary of this E V eta is going to be some par the the is going to be some parabola, and this E V eta is just going to be the uh, the region that's uh, on inside this parabola. Okay, so sparse means that so any expanders that the boundary away from uh, the boundary, you know, distant from E V eta, or the cone is actually distant from E V eta, then it's going to be. The interior is going to be this joint, yeah. So using this, then you can actually show that the thing is not drift to infinity, and also it's uh, going to be asymptotic to the given cone. Okay. Okay, so the first the, the construction of gamma three is not the point of the theorem. I think it's basically something already knew before. So now let's focus on how to construct this uh, annular here. So here the the key is the connectness. So the second step is, so you can actually, again, using similar minimizing procedure, okay, plus the barrier, and plus the barrier coming from to produce a kind of uh, stable expander. Prime as in how to the cone. So uh, I just want to explain, so what this ACI example is. This is basically stand for Agnan Trap Eumannan. So there's something here. Okay. So that example, I just mean that uh, one of this uh, rotation symmetry annular they construct that has an to rotation symmetrical. Okay. So 
using that as a one as a barrier plus this EV etan, then you're going to make sure that you don't construct something using this minimizing procedure that is disconnected. Okay. Right. So if you don't have that, you may actually do the minimizing, get this picture. Right. So but if you use this, then it actually tells you that this, you know, that your example actually has to exist in a space that's minus uh, this some axis, right? But then here, here, so I don't claim that uh, a prime, so again, so by this, you can't claim that uh, gamma 2 prime is uh, annuli. So it's connected as an to the double cone, but it may have actually genius a priori in, in the interior, in the compact region, right? Okay. Okay, so. Uh, the third step, it is, so as I said, uh, we, we, we sort of uh, want to use some continuity method. So to actually use that method, we have to pull in some uh, structures on the space of uh, asymptotic ex expanders, right? So uh, I'm going to first fix conical surface gamma and assume gamma is a uh, annular um, yeah, annular okay okay so uh, then I'm going to say, you know, choose some coordinate, uh, so gamma, outside compact set, okay, so it is given by graph uh, of function over C, okay, so C is the cone. So anyway, so you can you can use this parametrization, right? So you know, identify gamma outside k with the cone outside compact set, right? So on the cone, so we're going to take the you know the polar coordinate. So R denote the distance, radial distance. Omega denotes some elements on the link of the cone. Okay. So then using this map, you can also you know. Uh, think about this as a coordinate on gamma minus k, right? So then, so, uh, okay, so it's, okay. So remember, so uh, the cone we assume is a CK alpha regularity, okay? So. So we consider CK alpha here. So we consider the following set, so which is F. So this is the embedding. And such that F gamma is the expander. And most important is F has the Asymptotic expansion like R phi F omega as R go to infinity. Okay. So this phi sub F it is going to be some you know some embedding from the link of the cone to R three. Okay. And we have to mode you know it. Uh, caution the equivalent relation. So the equivalent relation here is F equivalent to G 
if and only if that f gamma equal to g gamma and phi f equal to phi g. So it is very important we require this. Okay, so basically, if we don't require this, you can think about so the equivalent relation just saying that you model, you know, you, you equivalent out, you quotient out all the possible diffeomorphism or parameterization of the same hypersurface, right? But this condition also tells you kind of a fixed, uh, fixed infinity, fixed parameterization of the infinity. Okay, so then we're ready to to state a theorem that we proved earlier. Okay. Mm. So we proved that this space it is a smooth Banach manifold. But the Banach manifold is the infinite dimension. We also prove that the natural projection map So which map f to phi f, okay, so this is a smooth fried home of index zero. Okay. And third, we show that this map is, is actually proper and fourth map has a well-defined integer degree. So I'm not going to write down the definition for the de in, uh, how we define in in integer degree. So that's not important. The most important is has a well-defined degree. Okay, so the point here, it is integer. If we if you don't require integer, so the first three items going to imply that it has a Z2 uh, degree. Okay, so this already going to tell you that pi has multiple degree. But if you want to prove it has an integer degree, then you need a actual work to uh, show it. And if you don't care about the stability of this annuli, then the motu degree is enough. But if you want to prove one of them is unstable, then it seems has to be used has to use the integer degree to deduce one of them is actually an uh, unstable uh, annuli. Okay, so I think due to the time limits, so I don't think I can really talk about the uh, the proof, the detail, the details of the proof of of this theorem. So the outline of the proof is a standard follow uh, following the work of White for the minimal surface with boundary. So now you just you, your boundary is just like a at infinity. Instead of have a compact boundary, now you have a ideal boundary, right? So then to prove this, basically you need to spend a lot of time studying the linearized operator uh, for expander. So 
the linearized operator for expander has the form of the following. So the main problem here is that uh, so this operator it is a self-drawn operator. <coughs> In this uh, weighted L2 space, the weight is given by this. So if you consider everything in this space, you need to consider functions that actually exponentially decay. But you can't consider function in this space because when you prove, for, for instance, when you prove the first atom, then you will need to vary the cone. But when you vary the cone, if you look at the expander uh, mean curvature, which is given by this, basically you try to solve this equation, right? And if you vary the cone, then you will see so this is going to only guarantee decay like a 1 over x. So you, if you choose your space to be in this space, then you're not going to be able to vary the cone. Because the linearized uh, problem you want to consider is L gamma u equal to f. And you try to figure out the right space for f, and then try to figure out for such f for what kind of u uh, you can solve this problem, right? So you know that f need to be decayed because in reality f, how you solve this equation, you're going to use some implicit function theorem, right? So the f is corresponding to some like a quadratic arrow term, right? So, but uh, if you allow vary the cone, then this f is has to be in the space like a linear decay instead of exponentially decay. Because, because if you write on the cone, so this is zero, this is decay like a one over x. Okay. So this f is, has to be in a space like a linear decay. So since f is not really in this fast decay space, then you can't appeal to the standard estimate or spectral theorem. Then you have to work from scratch to derive all this necessary estimate. And moreover, so because this operator is not self-drawned in some linear decay space, then you need to also, uh, when you try to prove some Friedholm property for, the, for, for this operator, so, uh, sorry, when, when you try to prove it's actually Bantle manifold, so then you actually also need to uh, improve uh, the decay for any element in the kernel. But anyway, so this is uh, uh, the technical part. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, as we said, right, so we want to use degrees here, right, so to, 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 to find this analyte, right, so we, we have to know uh, the value of this degree first, right, so, so not for every cone we can calculate this uh, area, but uh, for the narrow cone, so if, if the cone is actually very narrow or thin, so if C is very Thing, then there do not exist a connected expander asymptotic to this cone. So this is just because, so again, so we're going to use the parabolic definition for expander. So expander is actually can be think about as a self similar expanding solution of mean curvature flow. So then you can use a avoidance principle for the flow. Before we know that there is a self similar shrinkers 
constructed by Sigur Agnant. So you can imagine you put some say Agnant Taurus. So as a barrier, right? So you know that so then you, you see, so you, uh, using this agnet tolerance as the barriers, then you can show that you can't actually construct connected expanders. You still can construct a disconnected one using the minimizing procedure, but uh, the, the point here is the connectedness. So in particular, of course, you, you, can't con you can construct connected, then of course you can't construct annually, right? So then this tells you that for this Say this may be parametrized by. Uh, let me just abuse the notation so the. Zero. Okay. Right, so you can almost conclude the theorem if we know that this rotation symmetric annuli constructed by Agonent and trough and the human, it is actually the regular value of the pi, right? So there's an additional step which is show that, so, <coughs> so you have this agonent trough human and annular, right? So it may not actually, uh, the cone may not be actually regular value of pi, right? But you know the, you, you know that the such rotation symmetric cone can be approximated by uh, generic cone, right? Because uh, this is a, a general fact is saying that so the regular value of pi is dense, okay? So, so then you can find the uh, sequence of regular value of pi that approximate this rotation symmetric one. <laughs> and there's a compactness theorem. And for each one, you already construct a stable one, right? So then you get a sequence of a stable expander asymptotic to a uh, generic cone. And this generic cone is going to converge to the rotation symmetric cone. And then you prove, you, then you, you can pass to the limit, then you get a, a expander that asymptotic to this rotation symmetric cone. But then you can prove that if you have a stable expander asymptotic to a rotation symmetric cone, it has to be rotation symmetric then you basically show that for a regular or generic cone C, this is actually annuli, right? And the degree, it is actually zero. So then you know that there is another one which is unstable because the stable one contributes one to the degree. And then you have to have uh, something unstable to contribute something negative to give you uh, another one, uh, to, to make it to be zero, okay? So then this finished the proof, okay? Maybe, maybe, maybe I should stop here, yeah.